Tonight on The Conversation. In all respect to the music industry, we're basically, the more naked we get, the more press we get, which is very depressing for me. I mean, ultimately, for feminism to win, when feminism is won, it will just disappear. And people will go, but why would you have needed feminism? Everybody's equal. When I started modelling, my agent told me to eat one piece of sushi and smoke loads of cigarettes and drink coffee all day long. That was his advice to me. Conversation is a totally alternative interview series with women who have a story or experience to share. We talk about everything that women talk about. Relationships, sex, kids, career, money problems, body image. We're basically talking about the universal language of women. You were one year old when your parents moved you from Kosovo to yeah. London. And your sister was two years older than you? Three. She was three years old. Three yeah. years older than you. Tell me a little bit about that story. You know, I, I can't say I remember anything when I was one. I do remember having a hectic kind of life because we weren't really set into one house. Um, I can't really remember, you know, having a place that I could call home growing up. Why was that? because, you know, my financial status at the moment, my mother and father were kind of trying to find their feet, you know? Yeah, of course. And they came from a fresh country and, you know, having two kids and not speaking the language, there's only so much work you can do. What did they do? My dad ended up working in like a pizzeria, you know, to kind of find a flat that we could just at least live in. And my mum was just looking after us, you know. She and she was a, she's a psychiatrist, right? And now right? she's, yeah, she's a psychiatrist with her own ward and um, But she amazing. was in Kosovo. She was, but her doctor's degrees did not pass through to um, London, so it wasn't equal at all. So she basically, you know, started from scratch. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But it was such a crazy world for her because, you know, I, I, we were moving house literally like every month. God, that's really unsettling for a kid. I know, I, and all I remember caring about was whether my mum was all right, you know? It was very strange, I really didn't care about myself. Why do you think that is? When she moved to London, and I was about one or two, you know, she had breast cancer, and... Wait a second, she moved from Kosovo and she had breast cancer? When she got to London, she found out, you know, that she had breast cancer. It's the worst thing in the world to see your mother kind of crumble in, in front of you, you know? And, uh, and did she get, she got chemotherapy? How yeah. did she treat that? Well, she got chemotherapy, radiotherapy, lost all her hair, you know? Um, and there was not one day that you wouldn't kind of see her smile, you know? To us, she was a superhero. Well, she, she is, She just didn't so. have hair, you know? Because we were young, we didn't realize what was actually happening. And she got, she was cured. <sighs> Your mom is a survivor. She's literally, I think, one of the most inspirational, funnest... I don't think she's human. Her and Beyonce are, <laughs> are not human. <laughs> oh, um, my God, have they met? <laughs> yeah, they have. Yeah, no, that, that's really... You should put... That's a good match, mate. Put your mom and Beyonce <laughs> together. I said, Mom, <laughs> when I put them in the same room, I was like, I think I'm meeting both of the superheroes of my life. Yeah. Right Amazing. No, but it was... So you grew up, you grew up seeing your mom in pain and, and suffering. Yeah. But when I was 14, it was a whole nother kind of nightmare. That's when I realised what was going down. Well, you have another whole awareness at age 14. You know what? My mother is like the life of everything I do. So is my father. They're both so important to me, but for some reason, you know, when you feel like your mother is crumbling in front of you, you know, you're gonna do everything in your power to make sure she's okay. I can officially say now she's got, she's past the five year mark and she is 100% clear and it has not come back, so. That's incredible I, news. Thank God. But I wonder what that did to your mom. I just feel like, like the worst kid. I was like so bad in school and, you know, not knowing that she had all that shit to deal with when she was, when we were young and to have to do it again and then she's paying for my school and I was being so ungrateful about it because I, I didn't understand that she was physically un, unwell. Do you think that's why you try to make up for it with her? That's why I get her a house and I get her a car. And I know it never ever compares to like a kid's love for their mum and like the, the connection that they have. Ah, oh, it's just so annoying when you like, when you like, I wish I could have been a good kid. But you were a kid. 
doesn't matter. Like, you know, my mom, my sister was a good kid. You were a kid and people process, you know, their lives differently as well. You know, I was just kind of always independent. I can say that much. You know, my mum was really keen on me just kind of going to school and like wearing my uniform the right way and like, you know, not putting red lipstick on with your uniform, which is what I always did. What changed in your attitude towards life? What did that propel you into doing? I just never felt like I knew what was about to happen. Right. You just don't know what's going to happen around the corner. You, I kind of was like, if I lose my mum, then who's going to be proud of me? Wow. Like, who's going to be like, who would I have done it for? Because I... Do you I, do it for her now or do you do it for you? Yeah. I don't do anything for me. I do it for her. Everything I do is for her. I don't do a single thing. I don't care if I live in that p flat that I live in London for the rest of my life. Why not? Because I'm fine. Because my mum's fine. But are you fine? Yeah. It doesn't matter about me, because it's more than that. It's more about my family and making sure that our movement is just tight, you know? I mean, it's beautiful and it's People really... People always say, why don't you ever think about yourself, you know? I, can't, I do, sometimes. It's not important. It's not as important. Well, it's important to care for your family and to want them to be healthy and to have a home, but it's also important to care for you I know as that. well. I get told that all the time. You like, know what I mean? Like, I... I get told that, I brush it off, but it just always comes back around. It so. will, because if you weren't important. If you're not important in your life, then you end up not taking care of yourself and giving yourself what you need. And then it starts to debilitate your ability to give to the people that you love. So that's why I'm saying it to you. It does, it does. Are you surprised how your life has changed? Yeah. Because it seems to have changed pretty fast. Yeah, it has. Two years ago, I was in my flat. <laughs> kind of not knowing what was going to happen. That's extraordinary. Because you feel, do you feel like this was always going to happen? Mm. I didn't know, which is kind of what gave me hope. But I knew that I had to end up doing something like this. But you see, that's what I think makes, for me, that is what determines success. I very much feel like and when you course. know inside you, like, I am born to do this thing. This is what I'm really good at. I don't know what else I'm going to do. So I might as well put everything I've got behind you it. You have to. You have to and I not think be that afraid. If you have a plan B, you know you have a uh, you know you have cushions. You have an out. You have something to fall back on. I had no nothing. You can't fall back on anything. You know, that's what makes you hungry. It's true. It really does. And it's made me starving and I kind of still am. I'm never going to lose that hunger, but I'm just so grateful that, you know, I didn't give up. Yeah. My sense of you is that you have a gratitude and a humility around your oh. your life, which is really rare, I will tell you. Thank you. I think it's how you've been brought up. Yes, but what was there, was there like, I'm trying to understand what shifted in Let's you. Let's get deep, because okay? I, I've never done this. Okay. This is good for me to remember what I actually went through. Yeah, I want to understand what it was. Like, where were you emotionally? I can't begin to tell you how confident I felt when a man was interested in me. Like, I felt like I was sexy. I felt like I had a form of respect. I felt like he listened to me. Now I know he listened to me because he obviously wanted to have sex with me. I felt good that men fancied me. So I would, you know, wear low tops. I would put red lipstick on. I would, like, make my hair blonder. And, you know, my mum would just completely be like, what are, you, what are you doing? And I think that's what got me dressing crazy and why I love crazy clothes, because, you know, my mum always let me freely express myself. And it is, it, is a, it is an empowering feeling. Oh, it so is. And don't get me wrong, even to this day, if someone fancied me, I'd feel so great. I understand. The truth is, is that that experience that you went through, that experience that I went yeah. through, this many years later, I'm able to have that experience actually be a blessing for me. It is. You are one of the happiest people I know. You're happy. Thank you. You don't seem like you've been on the planet for 22 years. Everyone you have an old that. soul. Have you found it challenging uh, finding suitable men to date 
as your life has changed and you've become more successful. Oh, man, ja. Oh, man. Because we were talking a little bit about... We were. ...about how women, as they become more successful and they start to have more of their identity, it's actually harder to find men that are accepting and supportive of that. Yeah. And a lot of my girlfriends have had challenges in finding partners who who want I mean, them me to keep succeeding and yeah. earning because they feel threatened by it. It is very intimidating. You know, money, it's money. Money is intimidating. Money can be scary. Money can be powerful. And once you find a set stone for you as like a woman and living a life and you have a career and you kind of are like independent, you don't rely on your partner or your family or whoever, that's because you are financially and mentally stable, you know? And when you're looking for somebody, you already have that bit covered. Yeah. So you're just looking for a companionship. You're kind of looking for a cuddle. And a lot of people have money, but not a lot of people can give good cuddles. Exactly. And everybody loves a spoon. It's true. You know, I bet you're a great spooner. I am. I bet you are. I've been told. <laughs> I don't know um, how I know that about you, but I bet you are a great spooner. Am I in the shape of a spoon? No, you're fan just fantastically, your shape and your curves just say spoon me. <laughs> no, but so when I was kind of, when you're looking for a relationship, you're looking for that. And a man's instinct is to be everything that I've just said I've covered. Mm. And when they find that, the man has to be so secure with himself to be able to accept the fact that the woman only needs him for his comfort, his cuddles, and his amazing penis. Yep, that's it. I mean, that seems like a pretty good deal. That's what kind of, at the end of the day, that's what a woman, all the woman wants, yeah, really. Yeah, it's true. All the woman wants is like a companion and a best friend and amazing And a sex. nice cock. And, <laughs> it's true though. There's a big feminist argument that you shouldn't watch pornography, and I don't understand the logic of that, because pornography is some people having sex, and I can't see how it would damage me or be awful as a woman to see some people having sex. Feminism means um, that every woman can make uh, her own decisions and be respected for those. Freedom to choose without being judged or without any sort of inequality or attachments or guilt. That's what it means to me. A strong, independent woman. Yeah. You get what you want for yourself. You don't need a man to be there and expect him to buy you this, buy you a car. You get your own car, you get your own house, and you yeah. live your own life. Therefore, when it's time to take back the house, it's your house. So you're yeah. like, can you get out of my house, please? Yeah. That's it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Women wake up in the morning and immediately go, oh, I feel fatter than I did yesterday. I should not have eaten that pudding yesterday. What am I going to wear today? Oh, my God, look at my hair. It's really flat. This spot is coming through. I should have done my pelvic floor exercises. What am I going to do with the kids? This okay. is before they've even got okay, out of bed. OK, but why do you think that is? Why do you think women are almost pre... It's predetermined that we have these negative tapes. Why is that, do you think? I mean, there's so much. I mean, first of all, I think it's very easy to get despairing about the state of, of being a woman, but you have to realise that, that, that we've only basically just been created, really. You know, you're talking about 100,000 years of patriarchy and kind of women not being able to have conversations, you know, women being burnt as witches, women being vilified, women being treated as equal to animals, uh, women being owned as property. Uh, you know, women could be, uh, you know, sent off to a mental asylum if someone said that they were mad. Well, their husbands would send them off to a mental asylum. Yes, institute. if they became troublesome. Yeah. Um, all right, so, so we've so, not you know, had and, these choices. You and I that long. We, yes, so, so women are basically a new thing. It's such a tiny amount of time that we've been able to speak vaguely openly about the realities of our lives and to, to be able to be autonomous people and to have our own money that we still don't really know what women are. You know, it's a very tiny thing. I think we're, st we're still working out kind of, it's almost like we've kind of fallen out of a plane crash of 100,000 years of oppression again. God, you okay? You all right? But don't you what think, should we do next? But don't you think that both roles are confused? Because women don't have the same stereotypical roles that they've held for years and, and it's changing and men don't have the same roles that they've held for years. So men don't really know where they fit into a woman's life and a family life. And women don't really know also what our roles are with 
working, taking care of kids, you know, managing a whole nother set of things that we haven't been managing for that long. So both genders are confused. But what we haven't realised is that, you know, the, the, the very easy solution to this, because at the moment everything is being kind of pitched as if it's a war between men and women, like who well, will win on inclusive. childcare? Who it will should win be on... It should be but everyone doing it, both of us doing it. I mean, ultimately, for feminism to win, when feminism is won, it will just disappear. And people will go, but why would you have needed feminism? Everybody's equal because... I'm in this massive campaign at the moment to stop saying that things are a problem of feminism, something that feminism needs to solve. For instance, childcare. People always go, well, how's feminism going to solve childcare? Who's going to look after the kids? That's a problem of humanity. There could be anything agree. more obviously well, the problem of humanity, how we will raise our can children. Can I just say that when I, I interviewed Gloria Steinem recently and she put me on point when I said, as mothers, we need to be accountable that we are the first... Pe uh, person that's coming into contact with raising our sons. Yes. That's not raising sons. And she said, no, the fathers and the mothers need to be accountable. We are not supposed to be raising our children by ourselves. Yes. And I fully agree. To really change effectively the way women are treated on the planet, men have to be involved in the conversation. And this is why one of the sad thing, the things that makes me sad is when you get some hardcore feminists will go, uh, men can't be feminists. You get sort of really lovely men going, uh, you know, I want to be a feminist, is how your can I help? A feminist? Oh, yes, I mean, he, 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 he's the greatest feminist I've ever known. Mine is too. Yes, a... It's handy, yeah, isn't it? It's very useful. It's so relaxing. It's, it, you know, it's so much easier. Yeah. Oh my god. Yes. Right. Okay. So how does that show up in your in your home life? Does he take equal responsibility with your childcare? Tell me how that works in your you home. You know, it's really shaming. He's he actually does all of that stuff. I, I haven't That's why is that shaming? I haven't gone shopping because because it makes me sound like a spoiled bitch because I, I haven't gone shopping in a supermarket for about four years. Um, this is going to make me sound like the most spoiled woman who ever lived. I, you know, I have been around. I why, gave birth to them. Why are you shaming yourself so much? Stop <laughs> judging it's, yourself. It's not simply that it's, it's an equal relationship. He does do most of the work. It's, it's great. Well, part of being a feminist to me is just owning your truth about who you are and what works for you and what works for in your home works in your home. It's no one else's business to judge it. I must use that phrase more often. I need to own my truth. You Can do. you go and get me some more milk? That there would, you go. That's a good phrase. Thank you very much. I will do that. OK, but I want to talk about how long are you married? For. Um, it's coming up to 20 years now. Because you're getting nervous, I'm going to ask you a question about your Royally. husband. Yes, no, do. 20 do. years? Yes. He is, he's absolutely perfect in every way. You see, the thing is, I'll be frank about anything other than my husband, because he's a very shy man who wears a cardigan. I know, mine is too. He's a respectable man, he's a good man. I fully understand. But he's a cracking lay. I... Okay, I have a question for you. How do you keep a sex life interesting uh, in a 20-year marriage? Uh, I mean, I mean, generally just by being a filthy bitch. Um, and what does that mean that for you? That very much, uh, very much helps. Um, oh God. Do you watch porn? Yes. What kind of porn do you watch? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I... First of all, I think, you know, there's a big feminist argument that you shouldn't watch pornography, and I don't understand the logic of that, because pornography is some people having sex, and I can't see how it would damage me or be awful as a woman to see some people having sex. The porn industry itself it's, it's is true. horrible. I and a lot of pornography you. out there that you see. Although it's quite difficult, because my kids often borrow the laptop, and obviously when you start typing in you, uh, you know, you should oh, go to YouTube, absolutely. but it now goes to you porn. OK, now I have a tip for you. You must clear the history. They should do that. Clear all history. You must do that. I do that. That's good parenting. Seriously, that is mindful <laughs> parenting. <laughs> that parenting. is really mindful parenting. OK, so the other side of porn culture yes. that is really concerning me, which, again, I have two daughters, you have two daughters, I just want to talk for a minute about the fact that porn culture has infiltrated every fucking home yes. and that you have got young girls thinking that the only way that they can be acceptable to the young boy that they're going to have their first sexual experience with is to have a completely hairless vagina and be available for anal sex. Yes. Like a fast food restaurant 24-7. Yes. That I'm worried about. It's really scary talking to my beautician. She's saying she's getting girls who are coming in at 13, 14. Absolutely. Using their pocket money, asking if they can get Brazilians. I know. And just psychologically, what that says to you as a woman, kind of in a world where, you know, genitals are completely hairless, the first time, you know, the first indice of becoming a woman is that you start growing hair there. And in a culture where that's a problem, so, the, you know, the first thing about you becoming yeah. a woman is a problem. Exactly. That is shameful. Exactly. It's going to cost you money and it's going to hurt. You know, it breaks my heart. 13 year old, 12 and 13 year old girls removing their hair and it hurts. Exactly. Like, yeah. no. Have you had a conversation with your 13 year old girl about sex? 
Uh, I'm very aware that the oldest one's 13 now and she'll be out in the world in five years' time. And oh, so no, no, I've... no, wait a second. Five years' time? She's yes. 13? Yes. Where are you going to lock her up until then? <laughs> she's in the cupboard. We haven't she let her is. Out, no, yes. no, Kathleen, I've got news for you. 13, she will not be staying at home until she's 18 before she goes out in the world. Well, well my husband is quite certain about this. He's already planned what he's going to do the first time she goes to a nightclub, which is put, wear a suit of armour to pick her up and be standing outside the nightclub <laughs> with a full suit of armour, holding an axe, eyeing men up through the slit, going, <laughs> and that's my daughter. <laughs> I will defend her with my axe. Um, but theoretically, if we keep her until she's 18, that means I've only got five years left to completely change the world and make sure that horrible, evil things don't happen to her in, you know, and, in a horribly sexist world. And how do you feel like you're doing with that mission? The thing about feminism is, and I think so, lots of people have gone, you know, how as a feminist are you raising your children? Almost like I have a list of righteous things that I must instruct them in. And the point about feminism is it's not a set of rules, it's a set of tools. You just need to have two or three ideas in your head by which you can judge what's going on and go, no, this is sexist bullshit, no, this will be damaging to me, no, the reason I feel uncomfortable here is because something horrible is happening to my gender. And um, so, for instance, when we watch MTV, instead of me sitting there going, oh, Rihanna, Rihanna's so oppressed by the patriarchal music industry, we just watch her and go, Girls, here's Rihanna. This is one of the, you know, the biggest selling artists in the world. And this is the 13th video in a row where she's just wearing a pants and a bra. Poor Rihanna. Like, you know, right. what, what if it was really cold on that day? You know, she right. never gets to wear a cardigan. Like, kind of, what if Rihanna had really bad period pains that day or had a really bad cold? But how about that Rihanna wants to do that? So no one's making her do that. Although we could say, well, yes, society has conditioned her to believe that that's how she will get love and be accepted. Well, the thing is, it's just the stats on it. It's like the weirdness is, is, is as if. Like, for instance, because nearly all female pop stars have to be sexy and not very, wear very many clothes. Well, and they get shamed at the same time for yes. being that. Yes, yeah, so They be... get applauded for being sexual, but they yes. also get called a slut and shamed for being sexual. Yeah, it's a literal really lose, -lose situation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so why do you think no one had talked, has talked about feminism in 10 years until your book came along? Yes, well, that, that was the one thing I wanted to do, start a conversation. Because uh, the, that's you. how you change things is by, you know, that, that whole thing of consciousness raising is such an important part of, you know, it's not simply about legislation. Women being able to talk realistically and honestly about their lives. At any point where women have to lie and cover things up, that's energy that's being diverted from the revolution. <laughs> I was always considered to be uh, curvaceous and I think for the first few years of my career it was something that really I was put down for having mm. and it was detrimental and you know you'd go into castings and the response would be well she looks too healthy. I'm not the most comfortable with my body. I found some neck hairs the other day that was a bit upsetting. At first, I really wished that I was really taller, but then it didn't quite work out that way. Um, so now I just wish that I had bigger boots. I'm vulnerable, I have my flaws, I have my things I'm massively insecure about like anyone else. You won the DNA lottery, <laughs> and that's just the way it is, right? Thank you. Well, no, it's, it's true, right? So you, you've come out into the world looking a certain way which isn't sort of any choice of your own, mm. it's just what you were born with. So that has, you know, that has opened doors. Mm. Well, first of all, thank you. That's a very nice compliment. <laughs> I disagree pleased. with you about that, but, I, you know, I've, I've, my looks and, and, my, and, and, and or the way that I've looked or the subjective opinion on the way that I look has opened doors, of course. I'm a model. Um, I've never really been aware of it. It's not how I was brought up. I come from an environment where I certainly was never told as a child, oh, you're this, oh, you're that, oh, you're great, oh, you've got to do this. I was never pushed in that way. But did people, so, were you a beautiful child? Did mm, people say all the time, like, no, oh, she's so beautiful? No. It, I don't come from a, that world. It, I come from a f farm, you know? I come from the country. It, no one is looking at thing, material things, I suppose. They're not looking God, at... God, how refreshing. Yeah. Really well, was it weird having so much emphasis put on the way you look then? Um, or was it an adjustment? I don't know. It's, it's something I've never really overthought, I suppose. I just saw modelling as an opportunity for me to get out. It was an opportunity for me to travel the world, make money, um, have experiences, and really the most important thing for me, or what I had always... Um, seen modelling at was a, was, was a platform to the bigger picture. And so I always saw it as, right, what am I going to build for myself so that when I'm in my 30s or I'm in my 40s and 50s, 
what can this build for me? But it is amazing that you have this kind of foresight. Mm. Like, ha where did you get this wisdom from? I don't from? know, I just, it's that, you never know when your last thing is going, it, it, it's your last job's gonna be. I would be a really, really naive and really stupid to think that the way you look is, is, is going to just make you sail through life. I mean, it, it, gosh, if that only were true, it, 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 <laughs> you know, it's that. But do you feel that there is a pressure on you to have answers and to mm. know who Sometimes. you are, and you do? Sometimes, yeah, I do. It's uh, you know, I'm 26, so. I think it's a really pivotal time right now. I'm it really, is. you know, I feel better than I've ever felt and I feel like a young woman now. And then for me, I'm at this point where I am working out my views and my opinions on things and um, I do get a little nervous to, to express those things at time, you know, finding my voice, I suppose. And, and it's know, okay to not lessons. know. Yeah. For a while. And, it's, and uncomfortable. it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's massive. Because we all want answers. Yeah. We want to know, like, yeah. who am I going to be? Yeah. What am I going to do? Yeah. What am I supposed to be? What do other people want me to be? And you have to separate what other people yeah. want you to be from what you yeah. want to be. And sometimes they're so enmeshed yeah. Yeah. that it takes a while mm -hmm. to work that mm -hmm. out because you're, it's an image. Yeah, you live behind an image completely. You know, there's, there's, there's me, Rosie, and then there's Rosie, the sort of model and the, you know, the, 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 the figure that's known in, you know, in the, in the papers or in the magazines. And uh, let me tell you, the two couldn't be <laughs> further apart. They really couldn't be. I mean, it's, it's interesting. People that really know me are always like, oh, my God, you're not, <laughs> you're not what I thought you were going to be at all. So, but what is the biggest discrepancy, would you say? I think people are always surprised that I'm warmer in person than than I might be. I think with women they they can't they don't want to like you and 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 then when they kind of meet you there's that oh she's actually she's warm or she's funny or she's engaging and there's nothing really to be uh, threatened by. Okay, let's talk about that for a yeah. second. What does that feel like? I'm pretty pretty horrible actually. Cuz I love women. I'm a real girl. I know you are. Um Sometimes I get this feeling that someone's already made up their opinion on me before they've even met me and they don't want to like me from the get-go. And has it hurt your feelings? Yeah. There's one occasion I can think of that really stands out and it really, it really, really crushed me. It did. It crushed me. How do you reconcile with portraying an image of perhaps a person who's mm. a perfect person mm. to many with that being empowering for women, well, how do you reconcile with that? It has really very little to do with the way I look. I hope that I represent somebody that has really worked hard and my, you know, and I've achieved my dreams and whatever your dreams might be that through hard work, determination and being able to pick yourself up and, and, and try, keep trying because it, it wasn't a, a sort of, for me, I think some people might think that it was this sort of, easy journey and it, and it really wasn't, you know, and um, there was a lot of ups and downs and years where I didn't work a lot and, 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 and times where I had a lot of issues with my body and, 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 and all of that and so... What were the issues with your body? Well, I started modelling when I was 16 and to, to be honest with you, I wasn't physically right to start modelling probably until I was in my early 20s. I Why just, do you say that? I just wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't self-aware, I didn't care about the way I looked. I was shorter, I had braces, I had acne, I, you know, I Girl, if you got booked I, with, with all that I, going on, I, I mean... I, <laughs> I mean, no, I always thought you had much bigger boobs. Yeah. I must say, like, like, you know, people, like you said, oh, people think are surprised that you're so warm when they meet you. Mm. I was surprised you didn't have bigger boobs, yeah. I must say. Yeah. <laughs> I always think of you as, like, being, yeah. like, mm. having mm. boobs and a bum. Mm. Mm. But know, I, I mean, which you do, but for a, you know, for a model, I've always had that physique. I mean, it's and funny. Thank I was God, just by the way, thank to, God. Um, I mean, I was never a, really a Show runway girl. model because I was a little bit shorter and I had what are considered in the industry to be curves, which is absolutely insane. Um, I would never describe myself as being curvaceous. If you have curves, I don't know what I've got. I don't know. Yeah, but in, by an industry standard, I, I was always considered to be uh, curvaceous. And I think for the first few years of my career, it was something that really I was 
put down for having mm. and it was detrimental and you know you'd go into castings and the response would be well she looks too healthy wow she looks too sexy she's too voluptuous she has too much personality too much yeah and it crushed me as a yeah. as a as a teenager because and then what happened was it's who you were yeah it's you and then i started to work for victoria's secrets um, when I was 19, where all those attributes that I had as a, as a model and as a young woman or as a girl were celebrated. You found your home. And I found my home and I really excelled in that environment as, as a lingerie But did that do a model. number on your head, like when you were getting told you're too curvy? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> what did, did you, did you want to go and lose weight? Like, Not what happened really. to you? Not really. I'm more stubborn than that. So it you really... You were like, fuck you, yeah. I'm going to just, I just I'm going with my body. I just always felt like... Fuck you. Yeah, this is me. Yeah. You were telling me about your mom. She was really strong, my mum, and uh, an, an enormous personality. We'll talk to absolutely anyone. Oh. And she's just, she's fabulous. There's no other way to put it. She'll be mucking out the horse in welly boots and her long red nails. <laughs> <laughs> she's so, she's really just been this kind of, you know, I mean, she's an amazing support to me. We have a great relationship. I run everything by her. I tell her everything. She really? Yeah, because she doesn't judge. And I think that's the key to a, an amazing... Any relationship is that um, if you can be with somebody and not judge them, that is the sign of a, of, of a really strong relationship. It's so hard to yeah. do, though. Well, of course, yeah. I mean, I we, find We it... all do it. We all do yeah. it. It's human nature to judge, but... I think the relationships that really last and are really meaningful are the ones where judge, you know, judgment is at its minimal. So my mum, yeah, I could tell her anything. I love that. She yeah. sounds like she's her own woman. Yes, totally. She's such a character and she's, she's fabulous. I mean, when I was growing up, she's six foot tall. Wow. She's got an incredible body. She doesn't give a shit. Um, she, and she's she's just she speaks her mind. Um, she's really vulnerable as well, and she, you know she's brought up three kids, no help, very little money. Um, she's got an incredible sense of humour. Wow! What yeah. did she do for a job? When she was my age, she worked in an antique shop. She had no education. She flunked it out of school um, and regretted that her whole life. And she really drilled it into my brother, sister, and I from a young age that you've got to. You've got to make your own opportunities. You've got to work hard. You've got to bring something to the table. You've got to, you've got to generate yeah. your, own, yeah. your own income. She always used to say to me, Rosie, no one is going to hand you anything on a plate in life. What is your favourite sex position? Um, I knew you were going to ask this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would... Oh, my God, I don't know. Mum, don't watch this part. I have some questions that I ask everybody yeah. at the end. Oh, OK. I think I've seen this part. <laughs> <laughs> what are your vices? Oh, God, the kids aren't going to see this, are they? Sick no. Thank God. I drink too much. Yeah. I gossip too much. Yeah. Love eating raw onions. Really? French fries, the occasional cigarette. I definitely say eating too much chocolate. Cheesecake. <laughs> you like wow. Some salt on that and bite it like an apple. Oh, oh girl, I've never heard that <laughs> one before. Here are all my vices in one go. After 11 o'clock at night, I will chain smoke and I will drink too much gin and I will just go on and on and on about socialism until everybody's left the room. <laughs> so, um, mine would probably be coffee. 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 I have a problem. It's bad. Coffee and correcting people's grammar. And more French fries. Yeah. That's a big rise. <laughs> oh my god, remind me never to come to your house after 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> what makes you happy? Love and good food. Lovely at the same time? <laughs> if it's possible. <laughs> food, chips, takeaways. <laughs> Chocolate makes me happy. Chocolate, definitely. Oh, a bottle of wine. Chocolate. <laughs> and chocolate, yes. Really simple things. My friends, my family, my man. Cartwheeling. A very strong Wi-Fi signal. If I, if I can't connect to the internet, having a phone or a laptop that doesn't have any Wi-Fi signal on it, I feel like a deer in the forest that's next to its dead mother going, please come alive again, please come alive again. Oh, my God. Need the internet. Getting tattoos and eating biscuits. My 10-year-old son and cheesecake. Period dramas. Things you can't buy. That's what makes me happy. Humour. I'd say those are it. 
<laughs> what do you lie about? Um, <clears throat> my height. <laughs> <laughs> what do I lie about? Do I lie about anything? My weight. <laughs> I do it all the time. I could be doing it right now, you wouldn't even know. <laughs> I'm such a good expert. I used to always be a crazy, stupid white liar. I lie about my grades to my parents a lot. <laughs> when I'm drunk, I like to make up like alter egos and be like, oh, my name's Giselle, I'm Ukrainian. In a way, everything. Um, I mean, how big my hair is. I mean, naturally, it would be a lot flatter than that. <laughs> this is a visual lie. Um, when people randomly approach me on the street, I pretend that I don't speak English. So they don't harass me. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, makeup is a lie, but a beautiful lie. I always tell yeah. a lie when I, I'm always running late. Yeah. I've never been like, anywhere oh, on five time. Minutes yeah, I'm five minutes late. I'm five minutes down the road. I'm at the underground. <laughs> I'm in my house. I'm yeah. in the bathroom doing my hair or my makeup. Yeah. My friend's yeah. waiting for me for like an hour, half an hour. Yeah. God, I don't know if I don't think I'd lie about anything. I should do. I'm, I'm, I'm horribly honest. What is your favourite sex position? Um, I knew you were going to ask this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, this is all yours now. Why are you leaving that one to me? Traditional on top. Very boring, but yeah. <laughs> um, well, it... Mm, I don't like to stick to just one. You know, good old missionary, right? I'm with you, sister. They're so connected. I love you. <laughs> uh, doggy style. <laughs> I really like a blowjob. Like, really makes me very happy. Really? Mm. That is fascinating. I'm very oral, so it's just for me, it's just like a lovely meal that won't make me fat. <laughs> wow. It's like a fantastic snack. Doggy style. Same. <laughs> so I kind of like to turn around and then lie flat. And then, like, you use the spring to bounce. Wow. And then it goes back into you. <laughs> what? I don't even know. So I'm a big fan of, like, starfish sex, where you can just lie there and the other person has to do everything. No, I'm Am not... I weird? No, you're not weird at all. <laughs> Is that... That, we're going to call that the Rita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go for starfish. What would you tell your 14-year-old self? Um... Not to, and I will tell myself this still now, not to overthink things so much. Just, just go for it. Don't worry. You're, and and sometimes it's really good to remember that you're usually in exactly where you should be in your your life. Don't think about other people's opinions of you so much. I think that's what I would say. Watch out for your brother because he broke my nose when I was 14. It would basically don't do it for lots of things. Yeah. Oh, not to cut my own bangs. <laughs> um, there's more than one calorie in a potato. You appear not to have grasped that. <laughs> Make better boy choices. <laughs> You're gonna meet a lot of douchebags. To not feel like men finding you attractive matters. That's what I would have told my 14 year old self. Oh. All right. Yeah. Pretty deep, huh? But powerful. Feminism is a patchwork quilt, and everyone just does their little bit. It's a communal effort. One person isn't going to come along and solve everybody's problems. You cannot start a movement and make one person the figurehead. Yeah. Star Wars taught us that. You know, <laughs> you just need to have all, everyone in there, you know, with the force as well, because when it was just down to Luke, you know, first time around, you know, <laughs> you nearly fucked it up. <laughs> if you can meet a great guy, right? gorgeous, hot man. You know, you go back, you have amazing, mind-blowing sex. It's the, you know, the relation, amazing, amazing. But if there's not something of substance there in that person, there's not a soul or a sense of humor or intelligence or, you know, something that keeps you coming back, passion, mm. it becomes boring. And yeah. it's the same with any successful woman, you know, that might be physically attractive. I think that at the end, she might look a certain way, but behind that, there's there's probably some real there's some real well, grit, there's some real soul, there's, there's some a woman. real personality. I love the fact that people kind of think that I can help them in some way. I I mean, I never asked for it. I didn't expect to be a role model. I didn't think anyone would think I could inspire them in any way. But why wouldn't I if I could? You know. Um, 
there's a way of approaching being a role model, you know, you can't come across as intimidating or like you are so smart because you're not. It's just about, a role model to me is somebody that just really inspires you. That is some backcombing. It really is. I knew that I would reach maximum boof at the point where we went roll on this. It was just like, yep. And then I sprayed it with so much hairspray, I got high and my face froze. It was like Botox. <laughs> Hold on one second, I'm really sorry. Oh. Open. Good, stop right there. Ow, okay. Sorry, that hurt? No, it was good, it was good. That was my first interview for my UK show, that's so cool. Oh, was it? Yeah. That's great. I love it. Oh, uh, yay. Thank you. Bye.